Hey, it's Chris from the Felt Recoil Podcast. And before we start the show, I want to tell you about EnduringWarrior.org. That's the website for Operation Enduring Warrior. It is a 100% volunteer organization whose mission is to honor, empower, and motivate our nation's wounded veterans through a physical, mental, and emotional rehabilitation. Here's how that breaks down in the real world. I have seen these guys in action. It's quite, it's really unbelievable. It's almost surreal. You're dealing with combat wounded veterans mainly, and you see a really rolling thunder of guys come across the hill, and they're dressed in gas masks and camouflage clothing. It'll take your breath away, and then they're competing in what is basically a Tough mutter style event to raise awareness for their cause. Find more information about them at EnduringWarrior.org, and ultimately, you'll be enabling the lives of wounded veterans to go in directions they might have thought were impossible up until now, but this organization is getting out there and helping them get on with life because they sacrificed so much for us. Felt Recoil Podcast starts now. This is Felt Recoil. the felt recall podcast feels good to be back at home had about three days on the road we went to atlanta georgia for the nra annual meetings aka the nra show and nra 2017 all the hashtags just confuse me uh, until there's nothing left to be confused about but uh glad to be back should launch a campaign to sort of just narrow that down into one hashtag let's just agree on something let's agree on something on the way back from the NRA, we discovered a way to uh, save children's lives and fight terrorism at the same time. We'll get into that. My name is Chris, and across from me is... It's Patrick. That's my hetero life mate over there, and we do this podcast every week. Thanks for being here. Thanks for sharing the good word with uh, anybody around you willing to listen about Felt Recoil. We met uh, quite a few new folks while we were in Atlanta. If you go to FeltRecoilShow.com and click over to the blog, you can see uh, pretty much every video we took while we were there. A lot of new products, a lot of new innovation. I guess that's redundant. A lot of innovation uh, and a really good time. Uh, but first, breaking news. Breaking news. We need a jingle. Springfield. We need a lot of things. I don't know if jingle is high on that list. Springfield is very, 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 very sorry. Very sorry. I don't know if you know this, but they're very, very sorry. Um, I have a very confusing email from them. If you don't know, here's what happened. The Truth About Guns posted an article that said basically that Springfield hated the Second Amendment and, and gun owners because they had agreed to a carve out, as they called it, in a new bill, Senate Bill 1657 in Illinois, which basically puts a really undue amount of pressure on any small time gun shops in the state of Illinois. They exempted big box stores. They exempted anybody who does uh, nine or fewer transactions uh, throughout the year. Um, they exempted individuals transferring firearms to uh, family members. But if you didn't fall into any of those categories, you pretty much were screwed as far as like fees and licensings. And really, there's a lot of things to dislike about it, but it's an unelected board of five people. And on the board must be one anti-gunner. It didn't say that specifically. It basically said one person from an advocacy group for gun safety. But come on, we know what they're talking about. So anyway, <clears throat> Springfield apparently, supposedly, uh, dropped its opposition to the bill in exchange for an amendment being added that exempted gun manufacturers. And a lot of people got upset about it. I kind of take issue with beating up on Springfield. Just look, I get it to the extent of Springfield should have been smarter but I mean, you gotta you gotta beat up on all the other people that were exempted. Like if you're mad at Springfield, you gotta be mad at Walmart and possibly Academy and Cabela's and any company where less than twenty percent of the annual revenue was firearm sales was exempted. So I don't know what Cabela's and Bass and all those guys, you know, what the percentages are, but I'm supposing majority of it isn't guns. With their prices, I'm going to go with probably not. <laughs> Ain't nobody buying it, Cabela's. So there's a big backlash. I do take I have one more issue. Listen, the people like us who are out there posting videos of Springfield stuff, this is, this is just a hobby. Somebody <laughs> told me today that there's literally a guy that took his Springfield pistol and lit it on fire and made a YouTube video of it. 
Because he's so mad over this. It's so weird to me. It's it's weird. Like, all right. So I understand that Springfield they, they made a huge mistake here, and I think it's a PR nightmare. I would hate to be Stephanie Reese right now. Stephanie Reese, if you don't know, is the daughter of the CEO and uh, somehow coincidentally is also the director of marketing and communications. Weird how that works. And so um, for Springfield Armory. And so this week, Stephanie has the unfortunate pleasure um, (laughs) of dealing with the flop of the XDE and now the flop of a really misguided statement from her dad saying, uh, you know, oh, we've always supported the Second Amendment. Very, It was very blind to what was going on. And then he had to kind of retract that and issue another statement. And now the NRA's Institute for Legislative Action ha- is sending out an email that comes from Springfield Armory. Um, and then uh, it basically says the Second Amendment urgently needs your help in Illinois. The Illinois House of Representatives might consider this bill, blah, blah, blah. No, let me not blah, blah, blah. I'll read it to you. The Illinois House of Representatives may consider Senate Bill 1657 legislation that could put state gun dealers out of business at any time. It is imperative you share this with friends and family living in Illinois and strongly urge them to oppose SB 1657. SB 1657 would create onerous mandatory regulations, fees potentially in the thousands of dollars, and excessive amounts of red tape that would almost assuredly force the closure of many firearm dealers and prevent prospective owners from opening new ones. There's a bit more to it. You've probably gotten the email if you've ever been to a gun show or visited a gun website before. The, yeah, you got it. Anyway, uh, basically wraps up. Nash is to take action. It says it goes far beyond federal law and is designed to shut down as many FFLs as possible. Well, I hate to tell you this, but states are actually allowed to pass laws that go beyond federal law. Okay, they're allowed to do that. Now, here's the there's so much you could get into with this. I'll try to stay as succinct as possible. Tell me if I get too far off course. Here's something worth remembering. First of all, it was only a couple of years ago that Illinois made its way to the Supreme Court and was sued because it did not allow individuals the right to keep and bear arms. There was D.C. and Heller, right? And Heller sued D.C., The Illinois Second Amendment case, I cannot remember. Um, Let's Ah, McDonald versus the city of Chicago. There you go. Uh, That made its way all the way uh, to the Supreme Court. And uh, you basically uh, ended up just a few years ago. Let me see if I can get you an exact date. I did such good research and homework for this episode. When is that? That doesn't tell me when that is. Uh, but it wasn't more than five years ago. I mean, heck, it might have been two or three years ago. Um, here's what I knew, I do know. All right, hold on. Why there is no Second Amendment in Illinois? Man, people should date these articles. This is copyrighted 2012. So let's just say that within the fa- last five years, Illinois was forced by the U.S. Supreme Court to acknowledge the Second Amendment rights of its residents. That the individual has the right to keep and bear arms. Now... They don't actually need that in Chicago, though, because, I mean... It's so safe. It's just, yeah. It's a utopia. It's perfect. I don't know if you know this. There was a vote recently, and they're changing the name to Garden of Eden. It's so perfect. <laughs> um, so the confusing part for me is, who is who is surprised that Illinois is passing legislation that is anti-Second Amendment? That shouldn't be a surprise to you. Second... Try not to treat it like like Springfield Armory can make or break laws, okay? Just because one lobbyist says, well, we don't oppose it anymore, and then it passes with you know one vote, that doesn't mean Springfield made that happen. That means that it was so close anyway, there's no telling what exactly influenced it. Now, I have heard some rumors that there's mm-hmm. been a lot of money shuffling around, and that's, the, that's yes. sort of the big claim. So now the claim is a lot of anti-gun legislators in the state of Illinois received money from IFMA, which is a Springfield and Rock River Arms uh, organization uh, for fighting for gun rights, right? But I hate to tell you this. Here's how I'll phrase it. If you voted for Donald Trump, you cannot be mad at Springfield. It's that simple. You can't be mad at Springfield Armory if you voted for Donald Trump. Donald Trump has certainly donated money to Hillary Clinton in the past. He has certainly donated money to many more anti-Second Amendment politicians. More money than you will make this month. Happens all the time. 
all the time. It's, it's how the it's game an gets insurance played. policy. Yeah. In case the the bad guy does win the popular vote or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. and they get into office, so that you can say, "Well, hey, I helped you get there," even though that wasn't the guy you really wanted. Right. Yeah. You exactly. That's a great way to phrase it. It's an insurance policy, and everybody does it. It's kind of like you have all. You know, I don't know. I don't know the resume of the people over at Truth About Guns. And they are on a tear. Like, they hate Springfield now and, and Rock River Arms and all that. But it's almost as if they've never seen this happen before, but it happens all the time. Again, you can't have voted for Donald Trump and be mad at Springfield. And you also can't say, I'll never buy Springfield again and still shop at Walmart or Academy or any other big box store. That turns out is exempt from the law as well. You just can't do that because now you're suddenly a hypocrite. There's so another thing that I think everybody needs to understand. Okay, and again, I'm not defending Springfield here. Springfield has really royally screwed the pooch. They they should have been much clearer. They should have been. Chris, let go. The XDEs. I mean, everybody knows. <laughs> oh, we, we're not. We're wah, talking. About, we're not wah, talking about that. Wah. That's what I heard when I picked up the XDE. <laughs> by the way, uh, what a flop that's going to turn out to be. So again, Springfield's in, in the middle of a downward spiral. Like they have to figure something out. And they have to to fix the problems they have. But if I could Mm -hmm. step in real quick, always, Um, I think what they need to do is come up with a new M1A with a gray stock and call it a new gun. Problem solved. New gun. Okay. No, that I would almost bet they do that anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'll be waiting on my mailbox money. Thanks, Springfield. Jeez. So look, it's not that Springfield's right. Okay, I'm not saying Springfield's right. What I am saying, though, is there are a lot of people in the gun community who are flat out wrong. They're flat out wrong because they feel like they can blame Springfield and act like, well, Springfield's anti-Second Amendment, so they deserve all this and all that. But those same people voted for Donald Trump, who gave money to anti-Second Amendment politicians and, by the way, who supports Obamacare, who said the government has an obligation to provide health care for the people. So... Okay, I get it. Springfield is stupid. Is it a right or a privilege? Mm, eh, Trump's going to say it's a right. Oh, okay. There's a big difference, by the way, if you want to have that conversation. Mm. Um, so here's the other thing. In shooting, there's a rule. You know your target. You know what lies beyond your target. And you know what lies between you and your target, right? If you're anti-Springfield and you're taking shots at Springfield... You, you need to just keep your eye on the target because here's what's happening. Now there's a massive troll campaign and not just us, but many, many, many hundreds of other YouTube content creators are being trolled by people who go to the videos, give it a thumbs down and then comment Springfield sucks and they hate the second amendment. Okay. That's, that's fine. You can comment what you want to comment. You can thumbs down what you want to thumbs down, but you're really doing a disservice to those of us who just do this as a hobby. Like, why are you taking shots at us? We're not your target. We have no affiliation with Springfield Armory. I get nothing in return from Springfield for doing videos about their products. I've never received anything. If Springfield has never sent me an email or called me and said, hey, thanks for that review. Here's something else, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work that way. We have stuff that, that we've come across in our own lives and in our professional lives, and we review it if we like it. And if we don't like it, we usually just don't talk about it. It's that simple because we want everything to be positive. But now you get all these trolls. And it's not just us. I've seen it happening elsewhere, and they're going, Springfield sucks. Okay, I get it. But if you're such an avid gunner, Understand that you're not hitting your target. You're shooting things in between you and your target, and you need to calm down and take your angst out on Springfield and not on all of those YouTube guys who are out there. YouTube's a hobby for most everybody now, right? You're not making a lot of money doing it. You're not gaining notoriety by doing it. You're just having a good time. I like guns. I want to make videos about how much fun guns are, how cool certain guns are. That's it. That's Full it. disclosure, we had people come up to us at... NRA that asked us, you know, why we were doing what we were doing or, you know, how much stuff we were getting for free. Yeah. And that was kind of hilarious to us and shocking to them to find out that we actually, in fact, don't get anything for free. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They, I mean, we got some really weird looks. Well, there's people were like, wait, so not you to don't, be confused. You don't get stuff for free. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm sure there, there are guys that get stuff for free, but. There's also guys like us who just do it for fun. There's thousands of people just like us who just do it for fun. And I hate the thought because I don't really, I don't care. Like, I understand the trolls are wrong 
and they can come and have a little fight and, you know, get in a tiff. But I've asked everybody on our YouTube channel who has commented negatively about Springfield. I go, hey, that's great. Hey, by the way, are you making sure you're doing this on all the tourist videos? And they go, uh, no, what does that have to do with anything? Or, you know, I'm just bringing you the news and, you know, I'm a voice of the people or whatever the case may be. But let's not forget that tourists literally sold guns to terrorists. They knowingly and willingly sold guns to people trying to kill American soldiers, and yet the gun community did not go on a witch hunt for tourists. As, I don't as think far people as I know remember. about that one. Well, fill them in, because here's here's chance. <laughs> like, okay. With pleasure, please. So this was approximately eight months ago, I think, if that sounds about right, mm-hmm. and this went to the highest levels of Taurus. This is, this was a directive from the executives. Okay. And basically they were funneling handguns, approximately 8,000 of them, just to get an idea in your head of what we're talking about here. This wasn't like 20 pistols, Mm -hmm. 8,000 handguns that were funneled through Africa to Yemen. Mm -hmm. And they were caught. Well, it's probably, red-handed. probably going to all the Jehovah's Witnesses over there, so we can't be sure. Those damn Lutherans. <laughs> yeah, those two. So, I mean, so maybe here's here's the issue and why it didn't make as big of a splash. Springfield Armory, the, the name is synonymous with America and firearms, right? Sure. Taurus is synonymous with... Rundown South America. Brazil. Yep. And I think... When that happened, there was a blind eye turned to it because it wasn't an American company, and Americans pull that typical thing where we go, eh, I mean, it didn't happen here. Who cares? Yeah. And so I, I don't think people know about it. I don't think people... So if you meet a guy, and he's a passionate... Uh, Good-looking young man? Where like, are we going with like this? Like yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh sorry. <laughs> I thought I was in a bar somewhere. Right. <laughs> in, in Atlanta, maybe. I don't know. They're passionate about firearms. Is he dressed as a woman <laughs> with a red dress and curly hair? Does he look like Gru married Peter Griffin and made a baby? Yes. Since we can't agree. Okay. More on that in a minute. Please continue. So I meet a guy. He's passionate about Springfield Armory products. Oh, okay. That's that's more commonplace Yeah. than someone... I mean, who have you ever met that's like... I got everything Taurus ever made. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Right. So it's I true. think that's that's the divide there. But I think you're exactly right. People need to know about that and understand the difference. And and or maybe even just a, a side by side comparison. Yeah. Are are we boycotting and lighting guns on fire and putting the videos on YouTube of LCPs because these guys are selling guns to terrorists? Probably not. TCPs. Bet, or, excuse me, what I'm sorry. But it is a Ruger. Please do. Man, I wish Ruger... Accept my most sincere apologies. (laughs) Well, if Ruger would sell guns to terrorists, at least we'd know their guns wouldn't work. That would be awesome. Because we we could forgive them for that. Like, yeah, keep buying the Rugers. We could probably make some arrangements. Um, Here's the thing. Uh, It's about principle, right? It's Yeah, I'm not defending it. Don't get me wrong. No, 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 no. No, I'm with you. I'm with you. Everyone who's trolling everyone on YouTube or, or the truth about guns, they're trying to act like they're staying on principle. But you know what? Let's try it out. It is. Uh, it's eleven oh three on Wednesday, May the third. I'm gonna visit the truth about guns dot com. Let's just see what pops up here. Okay, all right, nothing yet. Okay. Oh, wait a second. I got a little banner ad here. Okay, that's for UNICEF. I'm gonna refresh. Okay, here's a banner ad for Gun Genius. Okay, Finger Hut. Okay, let me refresh it one more time. IWI, okay. All right, let's see how many it takes to get the Springfield ads. Because, uh, I hate to tell you this, but as of yesterday, the truth about guns, multiple articles in to just roasting and lambasting Springfield Armory, still taking their money. Still running ads for Springfield Armory. Now, that's an interesting thing because supposedly they're standing on principle and they want you to not do business with Springfield. Now, we'll say... I will say I'm thumbing through now, and I'm not seeing them. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if it stays that way. I've got screen caps. Let me refer. Yeah, man. I, listen, I took a, I did a video. I watched my uh, uh, calendar and my clock and all that, and I mean, it was 
two or three days out, and they were still taking Springfield money. And here's and the other point is if if you're on your principal, and this is all about principals again, there's a lot of other places you now have to not do business with. It reminds me of when I was in high school, and I remember our youth pastor um, advocating for a boycott of ABC because uh, or Disney. It was Disney. Um, Disney had done something, and he was mad about it. And nobody should watch Disney or go that to Disney. Mouse, I tell you what. Right. I think it was when they first started their gay pride parades. And I remember we were in the youth group, and he was all, yep, yeah. Oh, yeah, don't go to old uh, Disney there. And I remember going, uh, yeah, so, like, are you not going to watch ESPN anymore? You got to make sure you turn off ABC? Like, <laughs> how far are you taking this? And everybody was like, oh, yeah, good point. It's like, yeah, I mean, look, you can do what you do. For instance... I don't eat at Cracker Barrel anymore, and I don't shop at Target, okay? And there's a few, a few other places. There it is. There's one. Okay, it took a minute, but yeah, there we go. Springfield Armory ad on Truth About Guns. Well, I'll be damned, because they hate Springfield, right? Like, they're, aren't they? They're anti. Let me, here's what I'm going to do for you. Let me just uh, see if I can open this up. All right, so here's the point. If you're going to stand on principle, you got to stand on principle. And you can't act like, let me pick somebody and make them the whipping boy and, and you know, act like, well, now because I don't do business with this one company, uh, that simply means that uh, I am absolutely a man of principle. You have to decide and go all out. And it has to be equal for everybody. You can't just pick on Springfield and say, I won't do business with Springfield unless you can say, I won't do business with Walmart Academy and everybody else. Because well, otherwise you're a hypocrite. To me, looking at these banner ads scrolling across here tells me that this is nothing more than playing into sensationalism, and it really doesn't have anything to do with principle. I mean, that's the only way I can look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, whatever gets people to to read the website, whatever creates quick, quick the click. clicks. Yep. Here we are, Springfield Armory Gear Up Magazine Madness advertisement on the Truth About Guns on Wednesday at eleven oh seven p.m. on May the third. Interesting. It's just so interesting, isn't it? So not about principle. It's not about principle. It's about, uh, you know, you found somebody you think you can beat in the fight, and so you're going to go after them. Again, I don't agree with what old uh, (laughs) Springfield did. I think that was really, really stupid. I think uh, somebody should lose their job. That we can agree And um, I think they have a massive PR problem that they should address, and they should address in a better way than they have. Um, I can't imagine working under a CEO who would make a public statement only to come back and go, you know, I was uh, ill-informed on that, and so now I've changed my mind, but I said it globally. I mean, it just shows, for instance, the reason I don't eat a Cracker Barrel is because if you remember the Phil Robertson thing, where he described homosexuality as a choice and said the Bible considers it a sin. And there was this big backlash, and Cracker Barrel pulled all Duck Commander items. And I feel like they were doing us a favor by doing that, but go <laughs> right. ahead. Go ahead with your story. Well, then everybody starts boycotting Cracker Barrel, right? Oh, well, fine, I'm not going to eat there. If you disagree with what he said, and I agree with what he said— and you don't want to do business with him, and you're going to release a statement saying you don't agree with him, then that means you don't agree with me, and you don't like me, and you don't want to do business with me either. Well, then Cracker Barrel reversed and said, oh, no, no, we'll put it back, we'll put it back, we'll put it back. We we need Chris's money. Yeah, well, yeah, they did at the time, man. I used to eat the Reuben and drink a cup of coffee there (laughs) for lunch as a habit. Good place, it really is. But they put it all back on the shelf, and then it's like you're supposed to forget about it and forgive them. But here's the point. The point was they weren't acting on principle. They were acting on the bottom line, the money. And they said, if we're going to lose money because we carry their product, then we'll dump their product. Oh, we won't. We'll make money by trying to appease the people who agree with them. Then forget it. Put it back all, all put all of it back on the shelf. They have a management who simply is a populist management, and they do what they think will make them money. And of course, that's how businesses work. But my point is, if your business has um, um, proven that they don't want business from people like me. If you've made that your example, then I, I won't do business with you. I don't mind not doing business with you. It's just a matter of you have to tell me. And so when you tell me, then I won't. Okay. So I don't feel like Springfield is, well, we don't, you know, we, we're totally anti second amendment. I think they just made a goof move where, and again, 
let me be real clear here. I don't think their lobbyist removing opposition to the bill is the same as them pushing for a bill to pass. Okay. Because I don't think that's what caused the bill to pass. I don't know. I just don't believe that hype. I just don't believe it. And that's an opinion. People can tell you, well, no, you know, they removed it and then it passed. That's all opinion. Okay. There's no empirical evidence that I've seen uh, that can be quantified and said, here's exactly how, how that happened. So, I mean, with all the backroom dealings and everything else that goes on in right. those types of scenarios, it's really hard to narrow it down to one thing. And it's not justifiable just because it happens everywhere. Like, it's still, it shouldn't ever happen, but it happens. Uh, and, and I think there's there's a big misunderstanding there of the way politics work. And like you said, the midnight deals that no, get no, cut. No, no, everybody understands it. I'm sure. Everybody knows exactly how it works, Chris. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, Everybody apparently but you. Yep. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. So we'll leave it at that. But the point is, um, I, I, listen, <laughs> Springfield's got a rough go of it. If you don't want to buy their stuff, don't buy their stuff. I won't blame you, okay? The XDE is not worth buying, so I wouldn't buy that either. But I don't think they're, like, on the level of supporting terrorism like Taurus is. I don't think they're completely anti-gun or anti-Second Amendment. I think they made a bad PR move. And that's been translated as, well, they hate the Second Amendment because they removed their opposition to, to SB 1657 or whatever it is. Um, I would calm down. I would think clearly. Get off the bandwagon. And I would remember that the people pushing that narrative are still taking money from Springfield Armory. Now, I will say this. If Robsky and James Fuller are both saying there's something to it, there's probably a little something to it. Okay, I get that. Those are smart guys. They're not idiots. They know what's what's up. But again, grain of salt, word of caution. I would be careful buying into the hype from the truth about guns if they're still willing to take Springfield's money. And that's all I'm saying. All right, now let's put everybody in a good mood. You want to hear something fun? All right. Of course. James Comey was at Capitol Hill testifying. And after this, we'll recap NRA. Um, I just wanted to play a little bit of this audio. This is so, so good. Um, notoriously anti-gun, Senator Dianne Feinstein uh, is going to, she thinks she's going to pin old Comey to the wall here and that old Comey is going to play ball. Spoiler alert, it gets awesome real fast. Uh, Director, I have one question regarding my opening comment and I view it as a most important question and I hope you will answer it. Why was it necessary to announce 11 days before a presidential election that you were opening an investigation on a new computer without any knowledge of what was in that computer? I was trying to get paid. Why didn't you just do the investigation as oh, you no. would normally with no public announcement? Yeah, great question, Senator. Thank you. Um, October 27th, the investigative team that had finished the investigation in July, focused on Secretary Clinton's emails, asked to meet with me. So I met with them that morning, late morning, in my conference room, and they laid out for me what they could see from the metadata on this fella Anthony Weiner's laptop that had been seized in an unrelated <laughs> case. What they could see from the metadata was that there were thousands of Secretary Clinton's emails on that device including what they thought might be the missing emails from her first three months as Secretary of State. We never found any emails from her first three months. Hmm. She was using a Verizon BlackBerry then, and that's obviously very important because it, if there was evidence that she was acting with bad intent, that's where it would be in the but first three months. But they weren't there. Look, can I just finish my answer, Senator? Yeah. <laughs> and so they came in and said, we can see thousands of emails from the Clinton email domain, including many, many, many from the Verizon Clinton domain, BlackBerry domain. They said, we think we got to get a search warrant to go get these. And the Department of Justice agreed we had to go get a search warrant. So I agreed. I authorized them to seek a search warrant. And then I faced a choice. And I've lived my entire career by the tradition that if you can possibly avoid it, you avoid any action in the run-up to an election that might have an impact, whether it's a dog catcher election or president of the United States. But I sat there that morning, and I could not see a door labeled no action here. I could see two doors, and they were both actions. One was labeled speak, the other was labeled conceal. Because here's how I thought about it. I'm not trying to talk you into this, but I want you to know my thinking. Having repeatedly told this Congress, we are done and there's nothing there. There's no case there, there's no case there. 
to restart in a hugely significant way, potentially finding the emails that would reflect on her intent from the beginning and not speak about it would require an act of concealment, in my view. And so I stared at speak and conceal. Speak would be really bad. There's an election in 11 days. Lordy, that would be really bad. Concealing, in my view, would be catastrophic. Not just to the FBI, but well beyond. And honestly, as between really bad and catastrophic, I said to my team, we've got to walk into the world of really bad. I've got to tell Congress that we're restarting this, not in some frivolous way, in a hugely significant way. And the team also told me, we cannot finish this work before the election. And then they worked night after night after night, and they found thousands of new emails. They found classified information on Anthony Weiner. Somehow, her emails are being forwarded to Anthony Weiner, including classified information by her assistant, Huma Abedin. And so they found thousands of new emails and then called me the Saturday night before the election and said, thanks to the wizardry of our technology, we've only had to personally read 6,000. We think we can finish tomorrow morning, Sunday. And so I met with them. And they said, we found a lot of new stuff. We did not find anything that changes our view of her intent. So we're in the same place we were in July. It hasn't changed our view. And I asked them lots of questions. And I said, okay, if that's where you are, then I also have to tell Congress that we're done. Look, this was terrible. It makes me mildly nauseous to think that we might have had some impact on the election. But honestly, it wouldn't change the decision. Everybody who disagrees with me has to come back to October 28th with me and stare at this and tell me what you would do. Would you speak or would you conceal? And I could be wrong, but we honestly made a decision between those two choices that even in hindsight, and this has been one of the world's most painful experiences, I would make the same decision. I would not conceal that on October 28th from the Congress. And I sent a letter to Congress. By the way, people forget this. I didn't make a public announcement. I sent a private letter to the chairs and the rankings oh, of the wow. oversight committees. Did I you know it's a distinction without a difference in the world of leaks, but it is. it was very important that I tell them instead of concealing. And reasonable people can disagree, but that's the reason I made that choice. And it was a hard uh, choice. I still believe in retrospect the right anyway, choice, as painful as this has so been. So Feinstein uh, has to sit there and, you know, kind of feel like an idiot because now you find out actually there were emails there. And isn't it interesting that Hillary Clinton's the only one, only person in, in, in the U.S. in the history that I know of that wasn't prosecuted because she had no criminal intent. I mean, has that ever happened before? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, try that with anything else you do in life. I don't think that works with DUIs. <laughs> try it with anything else. Yeah, it wasn't my intent to get drunk and drive home. It just so happened. It just so happened. I went out for one beer, had nine, got in the car, and headed to the house. It wasn't my intent. It doesn't work that way. But anyway, I thought that was worth hearing because now we know, uh, obviously, she did break the law. and We've known that forever, obviously. She was sharing classified information with people uh, who shouldn't have had it, and uh, but she didn't mean to break the law. So, what do you think Anthony Weiner was doing with that information? Well, let's see. We know whom Abedin has ties to the Mo Muslim Brotherhood, very strong ties to her family. So, I would suppose that she was forwarding it to her husband's email account, so it wouldn't appear on hers, and then sharing it with very, very, very bad people. Wiener just seems too stupid to even know what to do with it. Like when you watch him. Well, and also preoccupied. Oh, that's true. That's true. Hey, girl, you want to meet up and read over some classified information? Oh, you're too young to read? I'll read it to you. He's a pedophile. Do you think his email address is Wiener, the number four, the letter U? <laughs> Probably now. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we spent the weekend at uh, the NRA show in Atlanta, and uh, it was a fantastic time. So, uh, Patty, I've come up with a series of questions that I would like us both to answer, but I'm going to let you go first because uh, I came up with the questions, and I think it's uh, a little more fun for you to answer, and then I'll try and not have the same answer as you. Okay? So, best of the show, what would you come up with? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, I think... <clears throat> Maybe the 509 from FN. Okay. And I think that's because it was pretty unexpected. Mm -hmm. Almost, I think, yeah, I would say every single thing I saw there, with the exception of the 509, I knew would be there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Leading okay. up well in, well in advance. Yep. Yep. So that one was a surprise. And 
And if you're not familiar, the FM509 is a 17-round 9mm uh, from FN that is pretty top-notch. Uh, if you want to see the video of the full rundown, go to feltrecoalshow.com. Scroll down, click the YouTube icon, you'll see there. Uh, it's in a picture of me holding a uh, HK. But anyway, click on that and you see the full rundown. Find us on YouTube, Felt Recall Show as well. Yep. All right. Best of show for me was the Hudson H9. Yes. Here's my surprise. Face. Right. And if you want to see the video of us interviewing Cy Hudson, again, same directions. All right. Most innovative thing you saw at the show? Um, hmm. I would probably have to say the Hudson. Ditto. Ditto. I, I didn't think I would like it as much as I did. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after hearing the explanation um, and, and the, the idea behind it from the source, yeah, I was pretty well convinced um, at just how innovative it really is. Um, and I think the reason it's innovative is because... Cy didn't know what he was doing when he started. He just had an idea um, and started sketching it out and kind of they've just sort of taken that through a natural progression Mm -hmm. instead of following the, well, let's do the John Browning thing and, you know, make a a gun that works just like every other gun. Um, And I think no matter what the gun is nowadays, because it's, you know, most stuff you see out there is polymer frame, um, tilting barrel design, striker fired, yada, yada, yada. So it automatically gets compared to a Glock. And when you see the Hudson and when you pick it up and you feel it, there is no comparing it to a Glock. Yeah. Um, The trigger is amazing. The ergonomics are very natural. So a lot of guys who don't like Glocks, I think you're going to naturally want to just shoot this gun and shoot it and shoot it and shoot it because, because it's perfect. Well, I don't know about all that, but oh, I it is very nice, and it sits nice in the hand. So if you're a 1911 shooter, feel it's going to feel right at home. Yeah. I would agree. Um, you know, it's one of those things we were kind of poking fun at. There wasn't a ton of innovative ideas that we saw. There are a few. But you get into these situations where you're like, well, this is uh, this is cool. What would you do different with this? And they go, well, we put, uh, we put slide serrations on the front of the slide. Okay. And that's your that's your new gun for the summer Glock. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We put uh, four serrations at the front. Which, for the record, I never so, saw one of those in their. There booth. you go. I don't think they were there. We walked all around the booth. We didn't see them. So from that to you talk to a guy like Cy, and he goes, yeah. So uh, on a standard gun, the torque on your wrist comes back at this angle. What we did was move this here and that there, and then we've changed where the slide bottoms out. And now the torque's going to come this way, and it's like, what? What did you even just say to me? And you have to go back and listen. Many, many times, which you can do at FeltRecallShow.com and uh, see Cy himself explain it to us. What was the most underwhelming thing you saw? What was the thing that you thought, oh, that'd be cool to see, and you saw you're like, oh, never mind, I lied. Um, that, this is an easy one for me. The Beretta APX. Oh, really? Yep. Hmm. Was a huge letdown. It's ugly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's first and foremost. But I can put ugly aside for functional sure so you look at that gun and it's got those big cutouts in the slide mm-hmm. um which run the whole length of the slide which i think is a pretty good idea actually in terms of manipulating it maybe you're in a situation where your hand's not gonna you know be able to grab the slide where it normally would so you got them all the way down it's perfect it's a great idea yeah again not real pretty yeah but we got our hands on it and the guys at Beretta were uh, very generous with their time with us and talked all about it, showed us the gun, um, and they had a lot of different variations already out there. So a lot of these guns, like the FN, they literally just had the one version. Mm-hmm. Um, the APX, they had different colors. They had um, different color frames and slides, different combinations. They had uh, tactical models with threaded barrels, they had stuff with fiber optic sights on it, all kinds of different options, which is very cool to see because most of the other companies aren't doing that. They're just going to show you the one, and and that's it. Um, but the reason why it was so underwhelming for me was it just seems like an afterthought. 
And what I mean by that is the slide doesn't really seem to fit very well to the frame. There's a lot of slop. Um, so, again, you go maybe, say, from the FN booth straight to Beretta, mm-hmm. and you manipulate those slides, it's a night and day difference. And so, for me, I feel like that's where a good portion of your accuracy is going to come from, is how well do those fit together. Any any old-school 1911 shooter is going to tell you that, and I think the same holds true no matter what kind of platform it is. But it just seemed very, very sloppy. So... That coupled with the fact that if you look at, say, the HK VP9 and the VP40, those two slides are different sizes. The VP40 is oversized to account for the 40 cal. The APX looks like they used a big slide for the 9s and the 40s. So it seems like the gun is a little too top heavy and just kind of weird. It was a bit of a sloppy gun. Um, but I have to say, that for me, the most underwhelming was Glock. <laughs> a, because it didn't exist, but also because um, when they sent the email, I was like, really? It's the best you can do? You're Glock. You're Glock. You're sitting on the greatest... Like, you are sitting on the most hyped firearm in the industry right now. You have the 17M. What What are you doing? What are you doing? Release that to the public immediately or die. That's, I, w- I wonder if they're sitting there going, well, we'll just let it ride a little longer and build some momentum. Remember the video of the Glock engineer that went around yeah. when the like when they hyped uh, the 41, was it? Or was it at, at the 42? That was when the 42 came out. 42? Everybody, won- everybody was mad because it wasn't a 9 millimeter. It wasn't a single stack 9? Okay. Yeah. That's what I felt like with that slide. That somebody can do that again, and oh, they all thought they were going to get the uh, FBI, you know, gun, and ah, ha ha, we do this. I mean, legitimately, mm-hmm. Glock could have legitimately stolen the show. Yeah, if they had just come out with the Gen Five. Maybe it's not ready. Who? I mean, who am I, right? But it is I, ready. It's called the Seventeen M. Well, there's people already carrying it. So they say. For a duty weapon. I mean, it's out there. Well, maybe production isn't ready. Oh, okay. calm down, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I, just, I'm just saying. You, no, you're right. I understand. I see what you're saying. There's probably a very small reason, in, or what we would consider a small reason, why it's not, why they didn't do it. Mm. But I'm telling you right now, mm-hmm. had that been when they unveiled it, you wouldn't have been able to get to that booth. Well, maybe they thought, okay, but if we unveil it at NRA, what are we going to unveil at SHOT Show? And they're like, good point, Larry. And then Larry's like, got an idea. Just take the standard Gen 4s that we've been selling. Why are you talking about LAV like that, man? I'm sorry. No, <laughs> different Larry. Oh, different Larry. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and they're all like, uh, what are we going to do then? And he goes, uh, I would just take the regular Gen 4s you've been selling, everybody, and I'd cut the slide at the front. I don't know. Call it, you know, the, the summer edition or something. <laughs> and they're like, we like it. All right, what was the uh, most overhyped thing there? What, what was hyped? And then you got there and you're like, what? what was all that about? As much as I'd like to avoid the topic, the XDE is definitely the most overhyped. I and I agree. think that has everything to do with Springfield's really odd marketing campaigns that they run where they show you like a piece of the gun mm-hmm. and they draw it out for so long. I understand what they're trying to do. Do you mean to tell me that you weren't glued to the interwebs for Night of the Saint for all six, two, 17 episodes there were of it? I have no idea. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know? There's like an internet show called Night of the Saint for Springfield and like some chick won it because it was only women involved in it? Nope. Yep. <laughs> there was. I got nothing. There was. She was at the NRA show. But, I mean, they, they lost me with the Saint marketing campaign yeah. and i think the saint is a good rifle okay great rifle I, yeah I'd, i would even venture to call it a great rifle very poorly marketed but the marketing completely lost me mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i mean what i i thought they were like gonna start selling under armor gear i didn't know what was going on listen let's just let's this is a great opportunity to talk about this for a second gun companies please listen you are mainly selling guns to 25 to 54-year-old males, okay? 
And the, probably the most prominent section of that are men 25 to 44 years old. And the vast majority of them are already married or already in a strongly committed relationship, right? Because the new trend is that you date for many years and then you get married. You, this getting married after six months thing, that doesn't happen anymore, okay? Dated my wife for a couple of years before we got married. I get it. I get it. Or long-term committed relationships. I get it. So if you're trying to sell guns to those guys, and I'm not saying that only guys buy guns, but I am telling you that the vast majority of people purchasing guns are, are men. It's, it's a demographic. You can't argue with the science of it. It's the vast majority of people buying guns are men. So you have to market to the man who is 25 to 44 years old. That, that would be a good place to start Nobody that I know, nobody I know, nobody that I know is hung up on a gun chick. Nobody. I don't know anybody who's like, oh yeah, she's super hot and she convinces me to buy guns. Uh, that gun bunny trend is, is so far so gone. It's so stupid. It's, listen, if I'm on my couch, right? I am 36 years old. I have a wife and three children. If I'm on my couch and I want to look at guns, I'm not going to look at guns where it's all women holding the guns because I know I'm going to catch grief for it. My wife's going to be like, oh, I see what you're looking at. You're looking at the gun. So I'm just going to avoid it. I'm going to avoid your materials. I'm not going to seek it out. I'm just going to not pay you attention. I'm going to have to wait till it comes out. And to be really fair, yes, we talked to several ladies on the floor who were extremely well-educated on the products that they were representing. Um, and I didn't see a whole lot of the gun bunnies there. Maybe I just wasn't looking. No, no. But no. I think the places where you would find them were not the kind of companies we were interested in anyway. Well, you're not going to... Look, if you've got gun bunnies in your booth, you're probably not going to be able to tell me as much about your product as the women working the, the other booths, right? Yeah, that's so what I'm getting at. When, when we got to Springfield, we had a lady who came up and was incredibly nice to us and very generous with her time, as we like to say. And she knew everything was to know about the XDE. You know, down to it's 27% lighter on the spring, so you can pull it back easier. You can you know, rack that slide that much easier. She was very well versed. And there's certainly women out there who could outshoot me today, no problem. My point is not putting women in your advertising. My point is when you do this thing where it's scantily clad, skin tight clothing women, and then you expect me to buy into it for that reason, what you're really saying is you think I'm too stupid to make an educated decision about what I'm going to buy. It's the same thing with these fly-by-night car dealerships or whatever it is where they just hire a chick to lay on the car and do their used car commercial, and then the chick thinks, oh, I'm a spokesperson, I'm a model. No, you're a used car salesman. That's what you do now. It's not You're not a spokesman for anything. You're a used car salesman. And you probably only got that job based on how you look. It's this funny thing where I wonder, every time I see these women, I think, I wonder if she knows why she got the job. Is she able to admit internally that if I wasn't... Uh, and if I didn't have the physique I have and I didn't have the facial structure that I have, I wouldn't have gotten this job. Does she understand that? Because what that does is if she can't understand that, then she has to realize she did nothing. She merits that job in no way at all. She simply got the job based on how she looks. And there's a lot of women out there who want to take advantage of that. Get on Instagram and look through the gun pictures. And there's girls who just want to sell you on the way their body fits. And it's like, okay, I get it. That works for you. Maybe you've got 100,000 followers. And so you're able to get sponsors and be a quote unquote brand ambassador, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But okay, you can be a brand ambassador now. And maybe you can try and sell me on some sort of AR or, or some coffee or whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day... If you're a guy like me who has the money to go out and buy the things he wants to buy, which is every guy in the world, by the way, we all have money to afford the things we want to afford. But if you're in a situation where other things must be afforded, okay, so you have a wife and a family and you have to be picky about where you spend your money because you're trying to pay this down or you're trying to do this with, you know, with your cash, you, you don't just flippantly throw it out there. So you're going to do some homework. And my point is, when the homework involves the awkward scenario where you might get caught <laughs> looking at something and going, ah, no, I promise, she's trying to sell me a gun. Uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. The Springfield thing was a bust, just like the used car salespeople with the women are a bust, and just like everything else where you're objectifying women to move your product, 
should be a bust. It's just this really strange thing that has happened for many, many years. It surprises me that they still do it. And it surprises me that must be there must be evidence out there that it works. But um, in the gun community, I think everybody would be wise to, if you're going to have someone endorse your product and you're going to ask her to bear to wear, you know, basically nothing when she does it, she better be smarter than everybody else in the room about it. And she better be um, better suited to use it than everyone in the room around her. Because otherwise, you're going to look really, really stupid. So when you watch the Springfield stuff, they're doing all these slow-mo videos and you're just watching the muzzle rise. <laughs> You know, and some of these shooters are never getting the muzzle back down after the initial shot. It's just rising up and up. And you're like, yeah, she's never shot a rifle before. She has no idea what she's doing. And they think I'm going to be intrigued simply because it's a chick with a gun. And that, to me, is condescending to me. And it's condescending to her as well. It's condescending to everybody in the community. Stop using girls just because they're girls. Use the girls. You know what? Here, here's a better idea. When we were in the Springfield booth, I don't know who they were, but there were two what appeared to be 10 or 11-year-old girls over there putting on a demonstration. Where are they at? Use them in your ads. There you go. You want to endear yourself to a guy like me with three kids or to any other guy just getting married who's thinking about having children or committed relationship type stuff? The women in a committed relationship will dig the fact that young girls are in your commercials. And if I'm watching a video of a 10 or 11-year-old girl running around using your rifle and just tearing stuff up with it, probably subconsciously I'm going to give the rifle a lot more credit than I'll give the young girl. I won't recognize that I do that, but I probably will. Those two girls were running drills. They freaking knew what they were doing, dude. They were suited out, huh? They, yeah, and they were, they were drawing against the clock and mm-hmm. doing a little demonstration. And so... It it just that right there tells me they know that that works. Why else would they be doing that, right? Mm-hmm. So why do the other thing too? Mm-hmm. And the only thing I can think of is that they think, okay, well we've captured that that major market of your men, your you know middle aged men, right? Mm-hmm. And so, well, how are we going to power grab and and get the, this female contingent on our side? And and so to me, I look at that and go, well, this was. This was just another sort of stab in the dark, thinking, well, maybe if we put a bunch of girls in yoga pants, all <laughs> right. the girls that are, you know, yeah. that are wearing yoga pants are going to go, oh, well, that's just like me. I guess I'll buy a Springfield. Mm-hmm. I just don't see it. They don't know. Those girls don't know. And can we, <laughs> one more thing. Can we stop with the yoga pants in public, please? Can we please stop? Because I got to tell you, for the nine hot chicks I see in them every day, <laughs> the three chicks that have never worn yoga pants outside of running to the grocery store scar me much more. So let's just stop with the yoga pants. Let's stop with this trend of active wear, but I did all my makeup. I get it. You might work out occasionally. I I doubt it when I see you and your active wear is actually your... Your stuff to wear around town. Publix is going to go out of business now, Chris. That means you're not... You're now that you're calling for this, Publix uh, is doomed. Maybe. All right. Because every woman in there just yeah, came from the gym in full makeup. It's so stupid. Hair's perfect. It's so stupid. Such a tribal, sheepish mentality. All right, anyway. Um, so, yes, please, stop with the gun bunnies, as you called them. I like that term. That's funny. Uh, it, nobody, Nobody's buying because of that. I think it's just a poor, poor thing. And really, the big point is, you could do that when guns were selling themselves for you. But as of November 8th, guns are no longer selling themselves for you. That's over. You better wise up. You better be smart about your marketing. You better stop thinking that you can play to the lowest common denominator because it's not going to work for you anymore. Not going to happen. All right, one more thing, and then we'll let you run. We want to talk about the Macy campaign. Macy, M-A-C-I. What are you laughing at, Elon? I'm not laughing at anything. <laughs> this is very serious stuff. This is this is so serious. My friend, I'm asking you to join us in a campaign to make all cars illegal. All of them. It occurred to me driving back from Atlanta that people drive like morons. You know this. I know this. Everywhere you go, you look around, someone is driving like an idiot. It's true. And every day... Hundreds of people die on American highways, roadways, and in our neighborhood. Children are dying because of cars. Terrorists are using cars to kill children. 
So is there a way that we can save children's lives and stop terrorism at the same time? Yes. We can make all cars illegal. And we do it in the same way the anti-gunners are trying to take our guns. We steal their verbiage. We steal their tactics. And we hand it right back to them and demand that they make all cars illegal. Okay? Exponentially more people die accidentally by car every year than by handguns. We touched on this recently, right? It's like uh, 44,200 people every year die accidentally by gun, and it's something like 500 people die. uh, Or excuse me, 44,000 by car accidentally, and then 500-something by gun. That sounds more correct. It's unacceptable that cars are still legal. What we need is common sense Car control legislation. Reform. Reform. (laughs) We're not asking for a lot. We're not. Here's what we think could happen. You take every car off the road and only government transportation is allowed. And in order to drive the public government transportation, you must be licensed by the government and you're held highly liable should something bad happen. It's going to clear up congestion on the roads. It's going to lower the death toll. And when we can get accidental car deaths Below accidental gun deaths, we'll go back to our conversation about guns. Are you with us? Macy, make all cars illegal. I love it. It's brilliant. Anything to add, Elon? I don't think a bumper can uh bumper sticker campaign is gonna work. <laughs> no, I guess At not. All. That would be slightly ironic. All right, remember to catch all of our videos from the NRA show. Uh, Go to YouTube and search out Felt Recoil Show. You'll see us there. You can also visit FeltRecoilShow.com. You can also always email Chris, that's K-R-I-S, at FeltRecoilShow.com, and Patrick at FeltRecoilShow.com as well. That's it for this week. We'll see you next time for Felt Recoil Show number 25. Man, it's going by too fast. We're just growing up so quick, you know? You wouldn't even... One day we'll move out and get our own apartment. It's going to be amazing. See you next week. More here on the Felt Recoil Podcast.